All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna make a start now. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, great. So we're continuing chapter 1.9, where we're looking at user interfaces. Does anyone remember or have an idea as to what you think of what you can remember is a user interface? You can put it in your own words. What would you say is a user interface when you hear that term user interface or if i say something has a user interface what would you say that means yes tosira so a software to computer works Software. Like the, um, apps or so. so the software that you're using on the computer? Yes, sir. Like, to get through. Mm -hmm. So, like the software that is on the computer to do something on the computer? yeah yeah you can think of it that way also anybody else what's your idea of a user interface what do you think it is so you can break it up into pieces um you have the term user and who is the user Who is the user? What do they mean by user? The person using the computer, which is yourself. Good, very good. That's simple. The person using the computer. So we know what that part there means. Now, what is an interface? Does anyone know what is an interface? What is the definition of an interface? So, if you know, Sorry, like a graphical display. Graphical display, yes, that could be one also. So, it's a point where two systems, subject, organization, whatever the case may be, where they meet and interact. And the verb form of it, it's something that you interact with. So that is an interface, something you interact with. So since the word interface refers to something you are interacting with, a user interface is basically what the user is going to be interacting with. So this user interface is found on different devices, your computer, your phone, your laptop, your um, the traffic light system, your fridge, your microwave, they all have a user interface. And the user interface is basically what the user is going to use to interact with that system so we have different types of user interface we have hardware user interface and we should already know the term hardware refers to anything that is physical so once it has buttons basically that is a hardware user interface so touch screen sensors digital cameras keyboards once you're doing something physical with that system in order to interact with it to do something with it that is a hardware interface and the other type of interface we looked at is the software interface basically we're interacting with the software we're not doing anything physical we're interacting with software so for example 
I'm sure you guys used um, um, if you have an iPhone you use Siri if you have a Samsung you use Bixby or even um, Google Assistant you guys use those already right Yes, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Right. So, using that system there, using um, uh, Amazon Alexa, um, Apple Siri, Google Assistant, and you're telling the assistant to do something, maybe search for a certain word, um, tell you what's the weather, that is a user interface. That is a software user interface. So you didn't interact with anything physical. But when you press that button on your phone, that is the hardware. So a user interface can be both hardware and software. So once you interact physically with the device, you do anything physical, touch a screen, touch a sensor, press a button, that is the hardware part of it. That's the hardware interface. But when you start interacting with the software, you the software starts to do something that is the software interface part of the device. So when it comes to software interface, we have three types. We have the command line interface, we have menu driven interface, and we have graphical user interface. So three types of software interface. The first um, software interface we looked at is the command line interface. Remember we're talking about software and the command line interface is basically typing in commands. So I showed you guys this last week that if you go on your computer and you type in command prompt, this was how the very first computers looked. There wasn't anything graphical. Ignore what you see in the all these icons you see at the bottom. Just this black and white area. That is how computers were in the past. And in order for you to interact with the system, you had to type in commands. So for example, DIR, I type in that command. I notice I got some information here. So this information that you're seeing is the folders on my computer. So, this software interface, which is called the command line interface, I am interacting with the system by typing in commands. Are you guys following so far? Yes, sir. Great. So, that is why it's called command line interface, because in order for you to interact with it, you have to type in commands. Now, the next type of software interface we looked at was the menu-driven interface. And it's just as the name indicates, it has menus. So this interface came out after the command line because the command line was difficult to learn because you have to remember all of the commands. I'm pretty sure you guys don't know what commands you have to type in here, right? Any of you know any commands to type in here? No, sir. You know a few? Something, no, I don't know any. Okay, good. So, most persons, if they're new to computers, they won't know what commands to type in. So. They try to make it easier for a person to be able to use a computer. So they brought out the menu-driven interface. And as the name indicates, it's basically an interface that has menus, menu options. So for example, when you go to, when you open Microsoft Word, if you notice, all of these are menu options. You have a home option, you have a new option, open, all of these options here. You have account options here. So if you click on um, account, we have some more options here. So we don't have to type in any commands. We can see menu options and we simply click on them. Now a more simple, um, simplified version of this was, is 
when you go to um when you go to KFC, Popeyes, and so on, and uh, you guys see them touching a screen to input your um, item that you're buying, that there is an example of a menu driven interface. So they don't have to type in anything. You don't have to type in anything, any command, like the command line. You just simply click on the options and that option would get selected. And that's how they interact with the system, by selecting the menu option. So that there is the menu driven interface. Are you guys clear so far? Yes, sir. Great. So the third type of interface is the graphical user interface. Please remember if you have any questions at any time, you can let me know. Stop me at that time so that you can ask the question. So the third user interface is the graphical user interface. And this is actually the interface we are currently using. It's the interface that is on your phone, that is on your computer. So the first paragraph says that all computers are now supplied with the graphical user interface installed because it is presently regarded as a type of interface which is easiest to use. So that is why we are using the graphical user interface. It is the easiest interface, it is the easiest way for a person to interact with their computer. Let me ask you guys a question. When you first got a computer or a phone, did anyone have to teach you how to use the basics of the computer or the phone? Or did you just play around with it and you got to learn how to use it within a few minutes? Uh, I played around with my um, phone. Right. So anyone had to teach you how to use your phone? Mm, no, not really. No. Anyone had to be taught how to use their laptop or desktop? What I'm talking about is the basics, like when you have to click here to go to shutdown, um, you have to click on start to see all your applications. Anyone have to teach you all of that? That you got to click on paint to open paint? Or did you guys just play around and you learned all that? Which one? Sir, I wasn't sure on how to um, shut down my computer, so I searched Google. <laughs> okay. But still, you did it on your own, right? Yes, sir. Good. So that is why um, all of these devices, that's why they're using the graphical user interface. Because it's so easy to use that some persons, they can basically play around with the system and learn where everything is. And just like how you did. You went to the internet, you searched for whatever you need, and you found it right away, and it wasn't that hard. So, it's easiest to use, and that's why persons, um, that's why they built it into systems today for us to use. Now, continuing the paragraph, the main features of the GUI include ease of use for beginners, the ability to cut and paste, drag and drop files among applications so um the ability to right click on something and uh, let me see open this folder here so the ability to right click on a file and click copy that is part of the graphical user interface the ability to click on this file and drag it and move it to somewhere else that is part of the graphical user interface. If you compare it to the command line, you couldn't have clicked and drag on anything. I can't click on this folder name and drag it anywhere else. I can't um, right click here and say copy this folder. So all of that, the clicking, the dragging is a part of the GUI. Continue the paragraph, however, GUIs require a lot of memory and can slow processing time. What this basically mean is that the GUI slows down your computer. 
So a computer, if we compare to the command line, for example, this here, if your computer was running this alone, it would run faster than having all of these um, icons and menus and all of these things here. So even though the GUI makes your system easier to use, it slows down your computer basically because it has to process all of these menu options and everything you're basically seeing. So the paragraph continues, sometimes simple tasks take longer than necessary because of the number of functions or steps required. So that's why sometimes your system might slow down because of all of these graphical things that are going on in your system. All of these icons, all of these menu options, the popping up and the moving and the dragging and the animations. Even simply doing this here, just simply moving this window like this here, takes a lot of processing power to do this here. Um, any of you ever did this here and your computer kind of slowed down? You see it, it kind of stuttered, like it, like it, it froze a little for like a few seconds and then it went back to normal. No one? Well, if you ever did, that is an indication that your system slowed down basically to try to keep up with that process in there, to try to keep up with doing that action there. So that is a GUI and uh, that is its abilities and its limitation there. Are you guys clear so far? Yes, sir. Good. So the next paragraph. A GUI comprises of basically four parts. We call that WIMP, Windows, Icons, Menus, and Pointers. So WIMP is the acronym. And so basically the GUI is made up of windows. So what you're seeing here, this box, this box where I have all of my PDF inside of, um, this Microsoft Edge wind, um box that you're seeing is what we call a window so if you notice the folder this is also a window this is what we call the window um, next we have icons icons if you look at the tree at the bottom the taskbar all of these are icons when you click on start you're seeing a bunch of icons here also so those are your icons menus so we have, if you go into settings, you have a bunch of menu options here. Even when you click on power here, even all of these here, these are all menu options. And then we have pointer. Your pointer is basically your cursor. So wherever I move the cursor, that is my pointer. I'm basically moving my pointer so that I can interact with the system. I can interact with the window, I can interact with the icon, I can interact with the menu. So those four components make up the graphical user interface. So figure 1.29 shows an example of a GUI with icons and menus. So this here is Windows 10, or it looks like it. So it's the same as I described earlier. So windows, what is basically a window? A window is a part of the screen that holds its own document or message. So a part of the screen. So as I explained, this here is a window. So most computers now use window-based programs. A window can take up the whole screen or it can be resized, moved or shrunk. So it can be move, it can be minimize. So you guys, I know you guys know all this already. So that's basically the window. Each time you open a folder, you see it, you see its contents in a new window. More than one window can be open at the same time. This is particularly useful if you want to move from one window to another or copy files from one window to another. So we might think it's something simple that everything here is opening inside of a window that this is normal to us everything is opening inside of this window 
but you, if you think and compare it to this command line interface where you have to type in commands there is no window here everything is just about typing in commands so these windows make it easier for us because we could simply have two window open like this here and we can be doing two things at the same time i can click and drag i could be looking at my folders reading my document at the same time all because of windows now we have icons an icon is basically a tiny picture of an object that is displayed on the screen normally you can use the icon in some way for example by using the mouse to double click on the icon of microsoft excel you start the program but that's only on your um, desktop or basically when you're in a folder you would double click in order to open a file or that icon there you would double click but when you're in a menu you do not double click you only click one time so you click on the, the icon one time and that there will open even these icons that you've seen at the top here it's only one click so it's important to memorize the difference that basically when you're um selecting at a certain location is going to be double click like inside of a folder or on your desktop but menu options are basically one click like for example if i click on download that's only one click there the next part of oh, next paragraph icons are designed to make things easier for computer users so instead of having to remember commands all you have to do is remember what the icon looks like and you basically double click on it and you open it search for it or so icons are not just for programs they're icons for folders recycle bin disk drives and printers and so on so once again if you compare it to the command line if you want to open the recycle bin you would have to know the command um let me see I'm not even sure what's the command. If you can just open the um, recycle bin just like that. But you would have to know the command to open the recycle bin. But for you guys, you don't need to know any command. You can simply go to your desktop and you would have the recycle bin icon on your desktop. And you simply click on it. You know it looks like a, um, a trash, a trash bin. And you simply click on that and you open that recycle bin. So it's no longer about remembering commands. It's about remembering what something looks like. And that makes it easier on us. So the next part of the uh, um, graphical user interface, we have menus. An advantage of using menus in Windows or on Mac. So remember the graphical user interface is not only for Windows. It's an interface for any system so it could even be from mac your um, iphone your apple computer your mac computer it can have a graphical user interface they actually do have a graphical user interface because they have all of these um, parts they have windows they have icons menus and pointers so what is this menu well, for most programs, the first few menus are always the same order. Um, they also carry out the same function, no matter which program you're using. So, for example, what I mean by this here is that when you open Word and you click on File, it's usually these same options that you're going to see. You're going to see an option for New. You're going to see an option to Save, to Print. Even if you open it on Mac, even if you open uh, Microsoft Word on a Mac computer, the file option, when you click on file, is going to give you these same options here. When you click on home, it's going to be these same options here. And it's even the same for other applications. Like for example, if I open spreadsheets and I click on file, Notice the menu options are basically the same. 
the home options are somewhat the same. Well, what can be the same? Notice the cut, copy, and paste. It's the same in both of them. So what can be the same? They will try to keep it that same way. Even paint. If you go into paint, notice there is the same file option. And when you click on file, notice the same options. New, home, save, print, and so on. So that is all part of the graphical user interface. To have menus with the same function so that when you're using another application, not a software, no matter the system, it has some similarities between them. So for example, the file menu is first and enables you to, um, among other things, to create, to save, to print, and so on basically most applications has this file menu and most of them i think i would even say all of them they have these similar options to create a new file to save that file to even print that file they would always have that those similar options there now we have two types of menus we have the pull-down menu. Pull-down menus are activated by clicking on menu items such as file using the left mouse button. The menu pulls down just below the menu item and you scroll down through the various options. So if you click on something and you get a bunch of menus and you have to scroll up and down, that there is what we call a pull down or we also call it a drop down menu because basically it's dropping down so if i click on for example this option here these three dots over here it came down that is a pull down when you go to microsoft word once again and you click on file all the options that are coming down those are pull down menus now in addition to pull down we can have a pop-up menu so a pop-up menu is as the name indicates it pops up in a certain location so basically when you right click somewhere you get a pop-up menu so anywhere i right click i get a menu that basically pops up somewhere and it's, it could be different based on where i am right clicking get different menu options so those are the two types of menus pop up and pull down or drop down so pop up menus are activated by clicking anywhere on the document screen using the right mouse button so once you right click anywhere you're getting a pop up menu some standard menus and options are available on these menus including cut copy and paste so once again they try to make the um, menu similar so the cut copy and paste they try to put that um notice you have you usually have to highlight but this is not a document so so normally when you right click you would see these options here the most cut copy and paste you would see those the most even if you go in paint and you right click i actually have to open a text box right click so notice you have the same options here cut copy and paste the last part of the uh, graphical user interface the WIMP we have pointers so the most common pointing device is the mouse so we also call the mouse a pointing device because as the name implies we use it to point wherever we want to work on the screen so as the mouse is moved a pointer moves on the screen the pointer is very is a very important part of the GUI as it enables you to control the computer and choose and to choose window items to select text in a document cells in a spreadsheet 
and to create drawing shapes and so on so it is what basically allows us to interact with the system to do something now other pointed devices is going to include your graphic tablet a joystick and a digital pen so that's what we use on touch devices you guys know what these look like graphics tablets digital pens and so on yes sir all right for those who don't know a graphics tablet is basically a flat surface that you use to draw on so it doesn't have to have a screen it can be without a screen like for example this one here so those are graphics tablets um, a joystick is basically um, a device that allows you to control directions so it's mostly used in games like for example um, flying simulators airplane um, simulators um, racing simulators and so on um, and then we have digital pens well those are basically stylus so you guys know what is a stylus so those are all pointing devices those are devices so instead of using your mouse you can actually use any one of these devices for example if your device is a touch screen like for example your phone do you guys use a, a mouse with your phone no sir no so what is your pointing device with your phone because remember you got the point stylus stylus now, something or your hand exactly yeah. good very good yes exactly so sometimes you, you might not have a stylus so your finger is your pointing device in that case because that will allow you to interact with the system Great, so those are the four components of the graphical user interface. You guys clear on all that? Are you guys clear? Following? Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. The last part of the this chapter here is basically improving interfaces. So software companies spend a great deal of time and effort trying to improve the interface so that the computer is easy to use. So that is their main aim, to ensure the computer is easy to use. Any person can open the system, turn it on, and be able to use it right away. An important part of this is to design the system software and application programs so they work exactly the same way each time they are used. And the menus are always in the same place. So that's what they're aiming for, um, developers would aim for. For the menus to be similar and for every time you use the software, it is similar for you to use. For example, even right now, this software that I'm using to record, if you notice, there's a file option right here. Um, most applications would have a help option at the top here, and they would also have this edit option. So they try to make software similar in terms of their menu so that it's easier for persons to use. People use computers so many hours a day, therefore the screen design and screen colors must be visually pleasing and soothing. However, some colors might be impossible for the visually impaired to see. Therefore, audio hardware interfaces have become useful. So we have a, another type of user interface here. This is basically a combination of um, hardware and software. So it's like if you're using um, an assistant, but it might not be um, the popular ones like Google Assistant and so on. It might be a specialized one, but it's that idea there. So that is it for this chapter here, user interface. So remember, user interface is basically how you're interacting with the system. We have hardware interface and software interface. 
All right, if no questions on that chapter, we're gonna move on to chapter 1.10. So in this chapter, we're looking at the different types of computers that you guys should know about. So why do we need to know about the different types of computers? Well, basically each of us need a computer in order to do some sort of work. In order to play a game, to watch a movie, to do something. You need a computer. And you need to know, you might think it's a simple, idea, a simple task that you just go and buy a laptop, you just go and buy a tablet. But think of an organization. Think of a business that might have more requirements. They would have to know what type of computer do they need exactly to do their job. So that is why we have to learn about what are the different type of computers and which computer do you need that will fully carry out every task that you need to carry out. So the first paragraph says, that we need computer systems in almost every aspect of human life. So from preparing meals to maintaining cars, traveling and so on. So um, we have computers creating cars, building cars. So are you going to buy a laptop to create, uh, create cars? Are you going to um, buy a laptop or buy a phone? to manage an entire organization. Remember, phone is a, um, a computer. So, for example, a control system uses machines to accept input as instructions to produce output, such as changing the red, amber, and green traffic lights, or even moving a robot arm to pack eggs. So what computer would you buy? What computer are you supposed to get to do those things? Once again, do you use a laptop on a traffic light to, to simply turn the light red, green, and amber? Or do we need some sort of specialized computer to do that? So the paragraph continues. A communication system usually transports data through the network from one point to another. A computer information system is responsible for the collection of data, it's processing it into information, and the overall management and distribution of this information here. So this term here is very important for you guys to remember. Um, we have what is called a computer system, and then we also have what is called an information system. And we have the definition here. An information system, the responsibility of it is to collect data, process that data into information, and then manage that data, to do something with that data. And then it's going to distribute that data for persons to be able to access that data. So if you think about it, it's actually like um, IPOS, inputs, processing, um, output, and storage, but it's a more detailed um, version of the IPOS, what exactly we're doing with um, these steps here. So the next paragraph says, computers and communication devices can therefore manage large amounts of information at a faster rate than manual systems such as filing, sorting, and mailing. So, that's the main benefits of using a computer. We have um, faster processing of data compared to a manual system. You don't have to go and physically um, spend a lot of time processing data when you can do it quickly on a computer system. Next paragraph, when choosing a computer information system for a particular application, you need to consider the following here. Basically, when you're gonna choose a computer, 
depending on whoever you are if you're a business if you're a student if you're going to be working these are some questions you would ask yourself what hardware do you need what do you need as input what do you need as storage what do you need as output so do you need a large display as output or can a small display work like for example um do you need a monitor as your output because it needs to um, do a lot of things on your computer so you need a lot of space or if you don't need a lot of space i'm talking about display wise if you don't need a lot then maybe a small phone or a small tablet can work so that's some questions you can ask which devices do you need now you can ask yourself what software do you need um do i just need to use microsoft paint and the applications that come with microsoft do i need to just use that then i could buy a simple laptop or i can buy a simple desktop because that can use it but can i buy a tablet can i buy a phone to use microsoft and paint and all of that the answer is no because the microsoft applications might not work so well on a phone or a tablet compared to a computer or even adobe applications i'm sure you guys heard about adobe premiere adobe photoshop so if you want to edit pictures now are you going to buy a phone to edit pictures or are you going to buy a desktop a laptop in order to do those tasks so what software you're going to use is going to determine what computer you're going to get what processing do you need to needs to be taking place so what do we mean by processing remember the calculations the what you need to do with your data so it all depends on your application once again if it's just word you're going to use then you don't need like um a high-end cpu when we talk about processing we're referring to the cpu because remember the cpu is responsible for processing so if you need a lot of processing for example if you're going to be editing videos you're going to be editing pictures you're going to be recording videos then you're going to need something that has higher processing but if you're just going to be using your computer for typing documents um, typing letters or whatever the case may be you don't need a lot of processing so that is where you can get a more cheaper system compared to um, a system that is going to be used for editing um, videos and so on so the fourth point what human computer interface is used so remember we just learned about interface what interface do you need keyboard and mouse do you need a graphics tablet do you need a joystick for example um, for example remember we talk about this joystick here flight um, simulator anybody ever heard about that flight simulator so this here that you guys are seeing this here is a computer set up just to run flight simulator so notice three monitors all of these hardware devices that you see in here notice the um, the joystick is over here on the left he has a, a specialized keyboard over here some sorts of specialized hardware here another um, joystick here pedal in the middle um, a, um, a pad interface in the very center so just to play a game called flight simulator just to play this game here this person has all of these hardware interfaces all of these hardware attached to his system 
so that he can play this game. So he had to ask himself those very same questions. What do I need to, in order to play that game properly? So what interface do you need? Which people are involved? What work are you going to do? So it's basically the same questions as above. What software do you need? What are you going to do with your system? So like back to this situation again. Are you going to be using your system to play games? Are you going to be using it to train yourself? Because even though this is a game, it's actually being used to train pilots. So are you going to be using your computer to train yourself how to work? Or are you just using your system to um, type a document? Those are questions you're going to ask yourself. What data do you need? The last point. And how are you going to get this data? So depending on those the answers, those questions can determine what type of computer you are going to need and what hardware and software you're going to need. Are you guys following all that? Yes, sir, we're following. Any questions? No questions. All right. So the next paragraph, the first four points were discussed early in this chapter. So that is why we learned about input devices. We learned about all the hardware. We learned about all the software. Because you guys should now have the ability to know what hardware does your computer need what input device does my computer need to do something what output device does it need what uh, processing devices it need what software what type of software do i need for my system so the paragraph says you can now apply this knowledge to decide which system and applications are appropriate in various computer rela uh, computer related fields based on their input, processing, storage, and output needs. And this is basically how you decide on your computer. The same IPOS. Because you have to decide, how am I going to input my data? How should I input it? Do I want to use a keyboard and mouse, or do I want to touch the screen? How do I want to process it? Or do I need to process a lot of data? or not so much data? Do I need to store a lot of data or not so much data? And how am I going to output? Do I need to print something? Do I need um, monitors? Do I need um, speakers? All of that will determine what type of computer you're gonna get. So now we're getting into the different types of computer systems that we have. So computer information system can be chosen to suit different users and tasks. They're also classified by their processing speed, storage, and portability. So these are the three factors as to how they classify the types of computers. We classify computers based on how quickly they can process data how much data it can store and whether that system is portable portable meaning we can move it around like a phone or a laptop so processing speed storage and portability that is how we classify different computers so the first type of computer we have here we call it the mainframe computer um, not see it mentioned here all right before we go to mainframe computer the largest computer you're gonna find is what we call a super computer so if you guys want to take a picture of this here take a picture of the definition so a supercomputer is a computer with a high level of performance as compared to a general purpose computer. The performance of a supercomputer is commonly measured in floating point operations. Actually, let me see if I find a better definition for you guys. Um, 
Jesus. Alright, so this is what they are used for. Supercomputers are used for complex scientific problems involving a lot of maths. So basically, they're used for when you have a lot of calculations, you use what is called a supercomputer. They're the largest computer in the world. So this is, this is what you guys can take a picture of. So the best com supercomputers, they fill rooms, they cost millions of dollars, and are thousands of times faster than the computer at home. So they're used for predicting the weather, um, model brains, or help predict result of nuclear explosion. So the nuclear weapons that you have in the world, they are developed because of supercomputers. Almost everything that is developed in the world, um, anything of Let me not say anything. Let me take that back. It doesn't have to be anything. But anything that was um, that required a lot of calculations, basically. Like, for example, even, um, even um, coming up with vaccines in medicine, you can use a, compu a supercomputer in order to do that processing of, the, va of the, um, the virus so that they can basically figure out how to come up with a vaccine for that um, virus there. So supercomputers are also used in that manner. So after the supercomputer, which is the largest, we have what is called a mainframe computer. So this is our second type here. So this term generally refers to a cabinet containing the CPU or mainframe. Mainframes are very large capacity computers with several CPUs capable of supporting hundreds or even thousands of users. So it's not as large as supercomputer, but it is large. It's what businesses and organizations would use. So the paragraph continues. Um, those such as IBM Z Enterprise Mainframe are built with spear components to prevent breakdown. So spear components. So your computer that you have at home is going to have one CPU, is going to have one hard drive, is going to have um, one power supply. We call it a power supply. Where it gets its power from. So your computer at home has one of everything so if one go if it goes bad that's the end of the computer until it gets a new one so what we mean here that has spare components the mainframe computers actually have multiple parts it has multiple cpu multiple hard drive um multiple memory um multiple su power supply so if one goes bad the other is still working or basically takes over for the one that went bad. So that is why mainframe computers keep working all the time because they have spare components. So what they do is that when something goes bad, they simply replace it with a new one and the computer basically never turns off. So the paragraph continues. Data flows between peripheral and communication devices users may connect to the mainframe remotely and only the system administrator will have direct access to the physical computer so a mainframe computer let me show you guys what it looks like do they have a picture no so this here is a supercomputer what you see in here notice it's an entire room all of these, um, this actually has multiple computers inside of it. So it's not just one computer, it's multiple computers inside of it. So in this image here, um, think of each blue line that you're seeing as a computer. Now, 
if we search a mainframe computer, it might look similar. It might look similar to um, the supercomputer, but in terms of um, processing and um, size and so on, it's not as powerful as the supercomputer. But it's designed as similar to the supercomputer. So this here is what we call the cabinet and it would have those multiple computers inside of it. Um, I'm looking for one where okay so this here what he's holding so notice the entire cabinet here see the entire cabinet but what he's actually holding here is the computer but i think this here just imagine i think this is more of the hard drives um this is multiple hard drives that you see in here and then these multiple fans that you're seeing i think we we're seeing as the fan i think that is the computer so it don't just be one computer inside of this cabinet. It's multiple computers with multiple parts, multiple power supply, multiple hard drive, and so on, all in this one cabinet here. So that is the mainframe computer. So if you notice, this mainframe computer, it doesn't look like the normal computer that you would use. Like, for example, this image here is not a computer that you just go to it and sit down in front of it and just start using it. It's actually, that's why they say here, you connect to the mainframe remotely. So you use your own personal computer. So for example, like how she is right now, she's using her own personal computer. And what happens is that this computer connects to the mainframe computer. And it uses what is on the mainframe so you don't use the mainframe computer directly it's basically a means to um, is what stores a lot of data process a lot of data and you basically connect towards it so for example um, Facebook WhatsApp all of you use that and you're actually using a service called Facebook and WhatsApp and all of this service is on a sir um, a mainframe computer so they're gonna have multiple mainframe computers and all of these are gonna run that service Facebook WhatsApp and so on and what you guys actually do you are connecting to that mainframe computer with your own device with your phone, with your tablet, with your computer. And you, through your device, are using that mainframe computer with the application and your device. Are you guys following me with that? You understand what I said? Yes, sir. All right. So the paragraph continues, um, primary and secondary storage are therefore extremely large and organizations such as banks, airlines, universities, government departments, those are the organizations that use mainframe computers. They are expensive to buy and they need a full-time staff in order to manage its operation maintenance and upgrades so it's not for everyone you're not going to buy a mainframe computer to use in your home because firstly it's expensive to buy so only organizations would have them like for banks airlines universities and so on so the next type of computer is the desktop computer which you guys should be familiar with so if you notice we're dropping in size 
We went from super to mainframe. Now we're at desktop. So desktop, also simply called a computer or a personal computer or a desktop system, fits an office desk. It's easy to buy, easy to upgrade, easy to maintain. Its tasks are for a single user. So only one user most of the time would use a desktop. When we say one user, we mean one at a time. Because yes, multiple persons can use these computers. But when we say single user, we mean one at a time. Whereas the um, mainframe computer, when it says here it can support hundreds and thousands of users, it means at the same time. That's what it means. Because remember, as I explain, multiple persons are going to connect to this mainframe. Because think of think of you guys. All of you, all of us, are connecting to Facebook. We're connecting to WhatsApp. So it's supporting the thousands, the millions of persons using Facebook and WhatsApp. Whereas a desktop is only for one person at a time. Now the memory size for a desktop, they're increasing, but it's not uncommon to find a primary storage device of eight gigabytes of RAM, hard drive size of one terabyte. So this I would say is, should be the minimum of a decent computer to have, eight gigabytes of RAM with one terabyte of storage. Now the RAM, this should be your minimum because as we learned with graphical user interface, that requires a lot of RAM. That is why your computer slows down. Because if you don't have enough RAM for this GUI, your computer is actually going to slow down. So it should actually be minimum. But in terms of hard drive storage, that all, that all depends upon how much data you have to store. So if you're going to be storing a lot, you're going to need more storage, obviously. But if you don't store anything on your computer, then you don't need all of this storage here, basically. So it's, it's mainly the RAM that determines how fast your computer can actually function. The paragraph continues, most computers now contain multiple processors working at speeds of 3 GHz. Their main use is for office and school work, games and entertainment, internet access and data communication. So that is, what, that is the purpose of desktop computers. Those mentioned there, um, they can however be linked in a network with more powerful computers. So when they say linked in a network with more powerful computers, they're referring to that mainframe computer. So that's what I mentioned in this image here. So she is using a desktop. And with this desktop now, she can connect to a mainframe to do more powerful tasks on the mainframe computer. So for example, on this computer, Say, for example, she cannot edit a video. She can't edit a video. So what she can do, she can send it over to the mainframe computer. And on the mainframe computer, she can edit that video. We're just using that as an example. So she can do what she can on her desktop. But if she needs more processing, if she needs higher performance, she can go over to the uh, mainframe computer and basically carry out that task. So that's just one example of how those two can be linked together. Now the next type of computer we have what is called a mobile device. A mobile device basically refers to a handheld device, something that you can hold in your hand. So that's going to include your laptop, your notebook, your netbook, tablet, smartphone, e-reader, game console. Yes, your game console is a computer and it's a mobile device. Um, they're similar to personal computers but smaller, lighter, and they contain a battery so that they're not restricted to being connected to electrical outlets. 
Um, in addition to that, the last type of computer we have is what we call an embedded system. An embedded system is a dedicated computer system that is designed for one or two specific tasks. So it is a computer, but think of it as a specialized computer designed for carrying out a specific task, a specific function. These systems are therefore embedded as part of a complete hardware device called an embedded device. They consume very little processing power and may or may not connect to the internet. So embedded system, depending on what is its function, it may or may not need the internet. So the main aim is to increase reliability and performance of the device. Embedded devices can be found in digital watches. So your smartwatch is an embedded system, your printer, your washing machine, the ATM, um, even four wheel drive vehicles, um, large installations such as traffic lights, those all use embedded system. You have a computer inside of them and the computer is designed for a specific task. It's a small computer. It is only designed for that specific task. So we call it an embedded system or an embedded device. Some embedded devices have no user interface. So notice here, they have no user interface, while others may use simple menu or touch screen. So for example, um, the traffic light system, some traffic lights might not have a user interface. It's just a computer that is programmed to know exactly what it needs to do. You don't need to interact with it anymore. They design the computer, they tell, they tell the software exactly what to do, turn on the green light for so long, turn on the red light for so long, turn on the amber light for so long, and switch between them continuously, and that's all it has to do. So in that case, you don't really need to interact with it. So it might not have a user interface, but some might have, but not all embedded systems would require a user interface. So those are your major types of computers that you have. Supercomputer, mainframe, desktop, mobile devices, and embedded systems. Are you guys clear on all of that? Yes, sir, we're clear. All right, any questions? All right, well, we don't need to rush. I think we have. We have, um, I told you guys your exam starts on the 28th, right? Yes, sir. All right, yes, so, we got, so we have two more Saturdays, so we don't need to rush because we can cover this next week and start 3.1 next week. So we have two more Saturdays. All right, so we could stop here for today because we covered a lot for today. Um, remember the main points? A user interface is a system, is a way basically that you interact with a system. You have hardware, which is referring to anything physical, and you have software, and you have three types. The command line, basically you're typing in a command. Menu-driven interface, you're basically interacting with menus. And the graphical user interface, which is made up of menus, pointers, icons and windows and then we looked at the different types of computers remember they're based on processing speed storage and portability so that would determine what type of computer you need and these are some questions you would basically ask so remember your supercomputer is your largest computer that you will have and then you will have your mainframe, um, then your desktop, then your mobile devices and embedded systems. All right, if you guys don't have any questions, we're gonna end here for today. 
enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, sir. Goodbye. Bye, sir.